Uh, next we have Lisa Keller. Welcome, and uh, proceed whenever you're ready. Thank you. Chairman Wiggum, Vice Chair John, Ranking Member Kelly, and members of the State and Local Government Committee. I am Lisa Keller, a member of Delaware City Council for the past 12 years. I thank you for the opportunity to speak in support of Senate Bill 22. As a local leader, I listened with great interest when Governor DeWine announced last week a metric to end mandatory health orders in Ohio, orders that have a great impact on the community that I serve. I wondered if this goalpost might indicate to you your work on this bill was no longer necessary. Not only does this bill continue to be necessary, but it very well may be our only path to getting back to the Ohio we remember. I fully expected Governor DeWine's metric would be related to Ohio's hospitalization numbers. Why wouldn't it be? A year ago, when we began the social contract of flattening the curve, we shuttered our businesses and brought our children home from school. We did this to prevent our healthcare system from being overwhelmed. No one can dispute the wisdom of working to ensure everyone who needs care is able to get it. Governor DeWine recently tied lifting Ohio's curfew to hospitalization numbers. But he didn't tie opening Ohio and releasing health mandates to hospitalizations. Because if he had, we would already be there. Since the beginning of this month, according to the hospitalization metrics published on the state's dashboard, COVID-19 patients make up less than 4% of our total hospitalizations. We wish, we wish every single one of those 4% excellent health. It's 4%. Less than 5% of our ICU capacity statewide. What is the justification for continued health measures? How much flatter can this curve get? And what more do Ohioans need to sacrifice to preserve hospital capacity that is nowhere close to being threatened? I then assumed we might be using the Ohio Public Health Advisory System as our metric for opening Ohio. I'm actually glad we didn't because we all know what a disaster that has been. Tying the colors of counties to case counts alone, keeping counties stuck at red for months and months despite improving metrics, my county is one of them, not a single one of our counties in Ohio currently flagging the hospitalization indicator. Not a single one out of all 88 counties. Even Governor DeWine has abandoned this system. It's fraught with statistical fallacies, but he kept the biggest weakness of the system, case counts. Not only did he tie his new metric to case counts, he established a brand new metric that's not just mathematically improbable, it's actually absurd, given our current level of testing. This metric is 50 cases per 100,000 in population, but I'm going to use a simpler way to look at it. It's 417 cases a day. And I included the math of how I got there in my testimony with all the numbers so that you can check my math. Dr. Vanderhoff announced he was unable to predict when Ohio might meet this metric. Well, in my community, we're depending on this metric to plan our future. So I don't know, is it really an acceptable answer? So I'm no Dr. Vanderhoff, but I took a shot at this prediction myself, same as uh, Vice Chair John did. I'm going to explain to you how this metric is not the answer for Ohio, why we still desperately need you to restore our balance of power. First, we could reach this metric, the one that took us 12 months to develop by stopping all testing immediately in Ohio. And that would be insane, right? Bear with me. You can't deny it would put us under 417 cases a day, and we know that wouldn't reflect the true level of risk in Ohio. So if this metric can easily be achieved without even measuring risk at all, why are we using it? So we can all agree that we're not going to stop testing in Ohio. So I had to pull out my calculator and start working through some numbers of when we might hit this metric. It's 417 cases per day. That's the magic number, and it's statewide. So the area that you represent might be doing phenomenally, and one area of the state isn't. But we're all in this together. 
So Ohio's current positivity rate is 3% according to the state's dashboard. That means that out of every 100 tests we give, three are positive cases. That's pretty amazing actually. And according to the World Health Organization in May, societies could consider reopening when they were below 5%. But Governor DeWine isn't using that metric because again, we would already be there. So if 3% of our tests are positive and we're averaging about 45,000 tests a day, that leaves us with 1,350 positive tests. That's more than triple where we need to be to fully open Ohio. So according to Governor DeWine, clearly things need to get much better than this. So how can we get better? We need to lower that positivity rate, right? So let's manipulate some numbers. Instead of every three people out of 100 being positive, let's make it one. Only one person out of every 100 people we test is positive. It still wouldn't be good enough. With a 1% positivity rate and the same number of tests being given, about 45,000, it's still 450 cases a day. It's still over the limit to open Ohio. By the way, this example is preposterous because we could pretty much have no COVID at all and still end up with a 1% positivity rate because of false positives on the tests alone. That's just statistics. So if we can't get there with a preposterous positivity rate, we have to lower the number of tests. Lowering the number of tests doesn't change the disease rate, but it's our only viable option. If we cut the number of tests in half, we're still not there. That would put us at 675. I'll skip to the punchline. The magic number is 13,900. That's exactly how many people a day we need to test to reach the governor's metric in two weeks. That's assuming our positivity rate stays consistent at 3%. Nothing about our disease and the, pop the disease rate in our population would change. We're just changing the number of tests. Again, if this metric is so easily altered just by the amount of testing that we're doing, why are we using it? And furthermore, why does anyone believe this is a legitimate path to opening Ohio? Ohio will be open when Governor DeWine decides it's time and not a second sooner. No matter what other states are doing, no matter what the legislature thinks should happen, unless you act decisively to end one person rule in Ohio that we've all been voicelessly living under for a year. Happy anniversary today, by the way. On behalf of the community I represent, and a councilwoman that knows how to do fifth grade math, I plead with you to provide the oversight we are in desperate need of in Ohio, and the political theater, and these ridiculous metrics. Reassert yourselves as the leaders we've elected you to be. Please act quickly and decisively to pass Senate Bill 22. Thank you, and I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you for your testimony. Do we have questions from the committee? Representative John. Thank you. It's great to see you again. Great to see you, too. So um, I uh, was on a call last week, um, and I believe last week in my district we had three people in the hospital for COVID. We have over 300 beds available. Um, yes, so that's great news that um, the, the case number and the hospitalizations, as you pointed out, has gone down. Yesterday, I tried to go to lunch and couldn't get into a restaurant because their capacity um, is, I, is so low that they can't serve more than a, a small number of people for lunch. And um, also, the, uh, uh, the money that you make in the restaurant business very, um, it, it, you have to, you know, do large numbers so they can't keep their employees in. And I, when they, when they told us that <laughs> they didn't have a table, I stated, I asked them questions. So are you unable to serve us lunch on a Monday afternoon because of the restrictions and the mandates um, due to COVID? And the answer was yes. I said, okay. So three hospitalizations you can't have lunch 
we are open. We are, that the governor has said that, we are open, but you can't have lunch on a Monday afternoon because the restrictions will not allow the, op the restaurants to open, the businesses to open fully, and then they can't make enough profit margin to pay their employees to be servers, so they also can't open because of that. You are from the city of Delaware. You have a lot of great restaurants in your downtown. Can you talk about the economic impact that this on, these ongoing mandates are having on businesses in your community? Thank you for the question uh, through the chair. We just had testimony last night at our city council meeting. We heard from a restaurant owner who was um, before us for a patio permit. He's trying to build a patio onto the back of his business, which is next to a grease pit and a parking lot and dumpsters, just to try to add capacity outside to stay afloat. The reason that he was before us was because he went before our Historic Preservation Commission and to ask for this back patio, and he was denied because it didn't meet our historic standards in the city. Um, we have a beautiful downtown and a wonderful commission that tries to maintain our historic standards. So we had a business owner who was appealing to city council, and in his appeal he um, mentioned some numbers that he began um, the year prior to the lockdowns about 40,000 ahead and ended up um, more than 40,000 behind. He also told me in a, a private conversation that we had that he hadn't taken a paycheck in a year, um, but he didn't make that part of his testimony because our business owners um, are hard workers and they want to take care of their employees and they want to take care of, um, of their customers. And the last person that they typically worry about is themselves. But this man has been working 12 hour days for a year without taking his own paycheck. And, you know, as a community, uh, we eventually um, granted that back patio, but our historic standards never anticipated that we would be in a pandemic that we would have business owners that needed to try to build patios next to grease dumpsters just to stay afloat, just for the opportunity to work for an entire year and not take a paycheck. And that really struck me. Are there any other questions from the committee? Okay, seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Thank today. you.